Hello and welcome to the 50 States of Film. I've set out on a journey across America to pick a movie to represent each state. And today, we're looking at Alabama. How do you cook your grits? You like them regular, creamy, or al dente? Just regular, I guess. Regular. Instant grits? No self-respecting Southerner makes instant grits. But if you do, I won't tell. Might I add, no self-respecting cinephile should reduce a state to its cuisine, but maybe we can define a state by its music. Ah, the maiden call of Dixie. Seriously, this guitar riff is so famous that some say the only person in Alabama who's never heard it couldn't. Of course, I'm talking about Helen Keller. What other state can take credit for Helen Keller's discovery of object permanence? Yeah, Alabama's pretty great. <laughs> Sweet Home Alabama is so famous that many films feel compelled, nay obligated to include the song, or worse, literally steal its title. I guess something about it invokes the faraway, magical land of Alabama, where young love thrives, where dumb is smart, and where giants will roam. A land that will defend the integrity of home cooking till the bitter end, so long as they keep the Confederate flag flying outside the state capitol. Okay, Bud Michael, give the people a break. How many years did they actually keep that flag flying up after the Civil War ended? Okay, you got me. Only about 150 years. On the bright side, removing the flag from the state capitol is symbolic of the Confederacy's legacy coming to an end. The flag's gonna live on. The Confederacy's gonna live on. The blood is gonna live on. This guy's got the South just running through his veins. Anyway, I would hate to conflate the state's love of the South with something as foul as slavery. Since I always aim to see the best in people, I will assume all Confederate iconography that could be associated with evil racist slavery of the past instead is about maintaining just a little bit of Southern pride. Alabama pride is like Southern rock, rebellious and spiteful of Canadians like Neil Young. Neil Young came out, you know, of course, with a couple of songs that put down Alabama. And Ronnie's saying was, hell, Neil, you're from Canada. What the hell you know about Alabama? I screamed Freebird three times in the mirror and the ghost of Ronnie Van Sant appeared. He took me on a wild journey through the South, and I'm here to tell you what I saw. I'm Michael J. Strauss Esquire, and this is the 50 States of Film. Removing the Confederate flag from the state capitol in Montgomery, a city that sounds best in the Southern drawl, is wholly symbolic of what a good story about Alabama must have. It is slow to change and will wildly defend its Southern identity, sometimes just to be scary. You know, let's try our best to make it a simple in and out procedure. So our Alabama pick has got to have some institutions like big government, the army, the courts, civil rights, Southern and young love, the Klan, and probably Alabama football. Before we go any further, I have to bring up one more piece of nasty business. When writing this episode, multiple sources have insisted I include something about Alabamans doing it um, with their, uh, well. Uh, I see you've already met Jay, her uh... Uh, other cousin. <laughs> Family. Yeah, doing it with their cousins. For the record, I did some really extensive research on incest. I found some pretty compelling arguments out there, but in the end, couldn't substantiate this claim. Newsflash, folks. Incest is illegal in Alabama, but is not a criminal offense in just two states, Rhode Island and New Jersey. See, this is where I think most of us come as non-Alabama natives. We're naive, inexperienced, and from New Jersey. Just like Joe Pesci, who plays Vincent LaGuardia Gambini, better known as My Cousin Vinny. Put Ralph Macchio, Mitchell Whitfield, and Joe Pesci together, and you get uh, me, a person whose worst nightmare involves being tried for murder in a state like Alabama. I shot the clerk. Yes, when did you shoot him? I shot the clerk. Hey, Dean, we need you out here. I'm in the middle of a damn confession here. Whoa! When will you learn, Daniel son? Don't self-incriminate. There's no better way to experience Alabama than watching My Cousin Vinny. Hear me out. The twisted, hilarious 1992 comedy classic that won Marissa Tomei an Oscar should be the state movie of Alabama. 
I mean, sure, it's not Sweet Home Alabama, but the sappiness of a rom-com just doesn't scream Roll Tide to me. And the civil rights epics like Selma and Just Mercy are immeasurably important too. But do those movies have the courts, the institutions, a bunch of hillbillies, pig farmers, a friggin' steam clock thing, grits, and loads of Leonard Skinner fans? who are definitely not racist. Hey, in 2007, Alabama officially apologized for its part in slavery, which is actually great, and it solved everything. That's how things go. You play by the establishment's rules in Alabama because what the judge says goes. I advise you, sir, when you come into my courtroom, you would know the letter of the law. I'll react harshly when you don't. So Vinny comes to rescue his little cousin from a wrongful murder accusation. It doesn't help that they accidentally admit to the murder, being in such disbelief that the Alabama criminal justice system would be so swift. Lucky for Vinny, he has a bit of a deus ex machina when his betrothed, Mona Lisa Vito, ends up knowing a shit ton about cars. There is no way that these tire marks were made by a 64 Buick Skylark. These marks were made by a 1963 Pontiac Tempest. This case has a special place in my heart in that it centers around the Southern delicacy of grits, which looks and tastes like horse cum. Vinny and Mona Lisa arise at 5.30 a.m. via the steam whistle alarm from the sawmill factory. How Alabama is that? And then Vinny learns all about grits. What is a grit anyways? It's made out of corn. Them hominy grits. Hominy? And then once the entire grit making process is explained and my Pavlovian appetite for horse cum returns, Vinny corners this confused man into a pickle. So, Mr. Tipton. How could it take you five minutes to cook your grits when it takes the entire grit-eating world 20 minutes? I don't know. I'm a fast cook, I guess. This all leads to this guy's testimony just falling apart. All because this guy is too damn Southern and proud and won't admit that he's a time lord of grit-making sorcery. See, sometimes this show is about food because it's about culture, guys. And grits culture is Alabama culture. When the Honorable Judge Chamberlain Holler, <laughs> what a name, decides to tell Vinny that he is dressed like a dumbass and wants some decorum, it really shows the value of Southern elegance, despite the fact that the courtroom is the most elegant part of this date we've experienced thus far. The rest is um, underwhelming, to say the least. Now see, down here, everybody gets stuck in the mud every now and then. Yep, yeah, we're famous for our mud. Famous for your mud? How's your Chinese food? Vinny keeps getting sent to jail for contempt of court because he can't dress or talk like a good Southern gentleman. When he leaves prison, there are a bunch of folks protesting the death penalty, which is the kind of thing that Alabamians actually deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. See, this should be the state movie. There's nothing overtly stereotypical or problematic about naming my cousin Vinny the state movie for Alabama, right? It's definitely not a biased Yankees gaze of the good old boys. It's not like this movie ever roasts Alabamians. Okay, okay. Maybe a wise guy insisting Southern stuff is stupid probably subverts state pride. We're better off for picking a state movie that does not believe Southern culture is built on antiquated, dead, and strange ideas of decorum that are best differ from America's morals and at worst is immoral in itself. But Alabama is known for some fun things, guys, like reinventing the death penalty this year and being morally confused about frozen embryos. A real obsession with using the law as an excuse to act ass backwards just because. And if you're a faithful viewer who might be from Alabama, you might disagree that things aren't ass backwards, but rather dick forwards. And I am here to defend every great American from Alabama to Wyoming because it's the ability to adapt, learn, and succeed that drives the American spirit. So while I really want to say that Vinny is our pick, I, I can't. The heart and soul of Alabama belongs to one man, the only true American hero since they killed Mr. Peanut, Forrest Gump. Gump. You want a chocolate? This novel to movie adaptation of Forrest Gump is sort of symbolic for Alabama. The state, like the man, is slow to progress and even with a sordid past and literally no prospects, can overcome and achieve something. And that's all I have to say about that. Forrest Gump is about the spirit of Alabama, sure. Force is found at groundbreaking civil rights moments in Alabama. Ma'am, you drop your book. Ma and in front of the whole country. That's all I have to say about that. And sure, he overcomes an ambiguous leg disability and breaks free of his shackles. I've always wondered if this is a sort of off-color slavery reference or just an overall inspiring moment. 
Maybe I shouldn't call them shackles. But yes, he sheds his braces and finds himself an all-American football player at the University of Alabama with an IQ of 75. Is that not the Alabama dream? Gump has done way more than the average human. He's a paradoxically progressive yet simple man. Let's not forget, we all love Forrest because of the man he becomes, not where he comes from, because that would be a long line of racists. Now, when I was a baby, mama named me after the great Civil War hero, General Nathan Bedford Forrest. She said we was related to him in some way, and what he did was he started up this club called the Ku Klux Klan, this is a wild factoid that honestly I forgot about until now, uh, but it makes sense and might even show a dilemma Alabamans face, reconciling the past. Ah, the Klan had embedded and allied itself with local police in the 50s and 60s, and they successfully did so with the police in Birmingham, Alabama, and Governor George Wallace's office. Watching Forrest defy George Wallace while simultaneously making a better name for the Forrest namesake feels, I don't know, pretty Alabamian. Forrest confronts other parts of his past when Jenny is like, hey man, you got a kid, and we named him after your racist grandpa, but he's smart as fuck and might be a psychic medium. I see dead people. That's a quote from the movie. Jenny is a woman who Forrest shares undying, sweet, southern, young love with. And I know, I kind of dispelled the incest thing, but that's, um, that's in here too. Sorry, Jenny. Anyway, Forrest becomes a modern man who is not racist and even had a black friend once. That's the kind of progress that screams, well, Alabama could be proud of this flick. It confronts the Confederate past, and while it recognizes its existence, looks towards an ever so slightly brighter future. If Forrest Gump can be a hero, I guess anyone can. Sure, he's no Helen Keller, but he's better. He can hear and see. With a little help from Leonard Skinner, seriously, this film has two Leonard Skinner songs in it, Sweet Home Alabama and Freebird. Forrest Gump is our choice for the cinema of the state for Alabama. And now some shitty log lines for our Alabama honorable mentions. Fried Green Tomatoes, Oscar winner Kathy Bates is kind of sad, but then listens to one of the most insanely Alabama stories of all time that ends with a human person getting served up as the sheriff's favorite barbecue. This one's a winner, but I fear tales like these invented the Karen. Big Fish, an old dad keeps telling the same story over and over again in a perfect southern droll, and it's about catching a big fish, would you look at that? But through a series of flashbacks, we get some cool Alabama elephants and football scenes and general crimson roll tide, and some nice Alabama pastiche. It's a sweet, nice tearjerker, or, you know, a good film if you like Tim Burton, or whatever. Talladega Nights, a whole lot of sweet baby Jesus and the Talladega Super Speedway puts it on this list. The Butler. The White House Butler talks about his life and how his time fighting for civil rights in some key moments, like Selma, allowed him to have the amazing job of doing turn down service and folding the president's underwear, or whatever the White House Butler does. The Miracle Worker, with Anne Bancroft and Patty Duke, two people you know by name but couldn't point out in the lineup, win Academy Awards. How about them apples? Just Mercy, a Harvard lawyer goes down south because poor people are being wrongfully accused of crimes they didn't commit. Sounds all about right. Heart of Dixie, the Rarity girls realize, <laughs> oops, the world is racist. The Rosa Parks story and The Long Walk Home, more civil rights movies that are not as good as Selma, but shout outs to Angela Bassett and Whoopi Goldberg. Crazy in Alabama. This thing is everything. Accents, nostalgia, civil rights tensions, a sheriff played by, hold up, is that Meatloaf? Worth a watch, one watch. To Kill a Mockingbird, a child and a man named after ghost orgasms exonerate a wrongfully accused man who's essentially on trial because of the color of his skin. Gregory Peck's Atticus Finch and the story are legendary. That's a pretty diverse list of films and we could get into the weeds about the legacy of these films, but Gump takes the whole thing, the entire shrimp and grits. Thanks for watching 50 States of Film. I'm Michael Strauss. Let me know which one of your favorite Bama movies I missed, but be careful, I might go fried green tomatoes on your ass.